What would you do if the God of the universe walked right into this room right now? Manifestly. Where you could see him, hear him, touch him, feel him, smell him, all the senses and then some. What would you do? There's really only two responses. We're starting a new series this weekend where we're going to spend between now and Easter talking about the seven mandates that we believe God's given our church. If you don't know this, this is the one-year anniversary of Pillar. Now, we've been a church, yeah, yeah. We've been a church for 11 and a half years. So we've been Pillar for one. And I didn't plan it this way, but the first message uh, of this new year and the, the one-year anniversary message is about what I believe is the most important thing our church is about. The first mandate that we're going to talk about is so important that I've actually chopped it into two, two messages, a part one and a part two. Because if we don't get mandate number one right, we might as well not even try the next six. That's how important it is. What we're talking about this weekend is accessing God's presence. Mandate number one is that we are to be a presence-driven church. And as I prayed about, Lord, how do I teach this? How do I impart this? Uh, I, I just sense the Lord say, teach them how to experience it all the time. What does it mean to be a presence-driven church? It doesn't mean a presence-filled building. It means a presence-carrying people. And over the next two weeks that I preach, I want to give you essentially a six-step guide to encountering God. Six steps that I believe if you will take these steps all throughout this year and for the rest of your life, you will encounter God in divine and supernatural ways. When we talk about the presence of God, many of us immediately go to the omnipresence of God which means the everywhere presence of God. Yes, most certainly, God is everywhere. Jeremiah chapter 23, God is the one, this is one of the places where God goes on record and tells us directly he is such. Verse 23, God says, am I a God who is only close at hand? No, I am far away at the same time. Can anyone hide from me in a secret place? Am I not everywhere in all the heavens and the earth, says the Lord? God is most certainly everywhere at all times. There is never anywhere you will or can go where God is not. But there is another measure of God's presence that is even better than his everywhere presence. And in John chapter 14, Jesus tells us about it. Listen to what Jesus says and promises about this measure of his presence. John 14, verse 21, Jesus says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him. Watch this next part. And manifest myself to him. The word manifest in the Greek is the word emphanizo. It means to make present or evident to the experience or senses, conceived of as a coming into sight or view. Here's Preston's simple men's way of saying it. To appear or to reveal, especially in a new way. This is the manifest presence of God. Jesus is the one who helped us understand. There is the everywhere presence of God, but then there is the manifest presence of God. Okay, question, how many of us would like to experience more of God manifesting, revealing, appearing to us in a way he never has before, more so in 24 than any year prior? Okay. 
Well, let's walk through the steps, and, and this weekend we're going to walk through the first three uh, that will help us experience more of God's manifest presence, because God's manifest presence is a greater, deeper, and more powerful measure of his presentness. So let's begin to walk through the steps, and then we're going to uh, practically walk these out over these two weeks of this sermon, okay? Are you, you ready to do a little work with me? All right. Step number one, if you want to encounter more of God's manifest presence, step one, you have to prioritize it. You have to prioritize. God's presence must always be a priority for God's people. If you have a Bible, flip over to Exodus 33, and while you're turning there, I'll catch you up to speed on the context of this passage. Funny enough, This whole little pillar experiment, which started 12 months ago this week, started with me sitting down with my best friend, like we have done for the last decade and a half, where no one was watching, and I was simply just talking about my favorite chapter in the Old Testament, Exodus 33, and it resonated to a a, a degree. This, to me, is one of, Exodus 33, is one of the holiest interactions between God and one of his human best friends. And if you have been at this church for any amount of time, you've heard me refer to this chapter a lot. Here's why. I've patterned my life after chapter 33 and 34. I think Exodus 33 and 34, they serve as a cheat code for anyone trying to walk in intimate fellowship with the God of the universe. But the context of 33 is in 32, Moses is up on the mountain with God, experiencing the manifest presence of God for 40 days. While Moses is present with God and God is present with Moses up on top of of the mountain, down at the bottom of the mountain, the people find a man who will give them what they want. Now, the reason they did this while Moses was with God is because Moses never would have done it. The people find Aaron, and Aaron, because the people wanted it, fashioned a golden calf, and the people worshipped it. Of course, Moses comes down the hill, sees what's happening, gets quite angry about it. Several thousand people die as a result. That was the Lord's doing, not Moses. And that brings us into chapter 33, kind of a morbid way to enter a really holy conversation between God and man. But it helps to point out the fact that Moses was altogether different from all the other humans alive in that day. Moses says to God in Exodus 33, he says, you keep telling me, that means repetitively, you keep telling me I'm going to the land of the promise, but what you haven't told me is who's going with me. And God goes, how about I I personally go with you? And everything will go well for you, and I will give you rest. Watch how Moses responds in Exodus 33, starting in verse 15. Moses says, if you don't personally go with us, Don't make us leave this place. Here's what he's saying. God, you are here in this place. Don't ask us to go to that place if you're not going to be in that place. Your presence is more important to us than any place. This is profound. Now remember, I don't have enough time to, to go there, but remember how Moses' life ends up on top of the mountain with God, and the two of them are overlooking the land of the promise, which he's not allowed to go into now. He's about to die. And there he is with his best friend. And here's what I personally believe. In that moment, Moses could not have cared less about the promised land because he was in the tangible manifest presence of God. He realized the best part of life is not the promise of God. It's the presence of God. So he says, wait a minute. You mean there's a chance you wouldn't go with us? Watch verse 16. Moses says, but how will anyone know that you look favorably on me? Interestingly enough, Moses connects the favor of God with the presence of God. E-N-C-E, not E-N-T-S. How many people rolling around today connect the favor of God with the presence of God? E-N-T-S. Moses said, 
if you don't go with us, how will anybody know that you look favorably on me? Then he says, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us. Watch this next sentence. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. Do you know how many times we start our day looking into a mirror without even realizing what we're doing is looking, going, look at what makes me different than everybody else. You know the way you were created to find out what makes you different? Close your eyes. It's the fact that God is with you, not just the way God made you that makes you different. Moses says, this is what makes me different. Long after I'm dead, and one of you asks my son Tyler, describe your daddy for me. I don't want him to say he was a vocational minister. I don't want Tyler to even say he was an awesome daddy. What I want my son to say is, my daddy was a man of God's presence. That's how I would describe my daddy in a sentence. This is, Moses is modeling this for us. What it looks like to prioritize the presence of God. Well, how do you know you prioritize God's presence? Two things I want to give you. First, the consistency of your practice. A man named Brother Lawrence wrote a book many, many years ago called Practicing the Presence of God. I had to read it when I was a 19-year-old boy in college at GCU, and it was a book that shaped me. One of the ways you know you are prioritizing God's presence is the consistency of your practice. Now, while these are amazing words, we hear Moses say that your presence is more important than the promise. Long before Moses uttered these words, Moses was living these words. Let me show you in verse 7 of Exodus 33. You can look at it if you're there. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting. What does it mean, practice? Something he did over and 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 over. It was his practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance away from the camp. What was the tent of meeting? The tent of meeting was the place where Moses consistently communed with God and encountered his manifest presence. How can we expect to experience more of God when we aren't dedicating and devoting ourselves to more time alone and away with God? Second way you know you are prioritizing God's presence is the immediacy immediacy of your response. One of the ways you know you're not in my family is that if you call me twice back to back while I'm in a meeting, I will not answer. But if one of my kids or my wife calls me back to back, two times, back to back in a row, I could be meeting with the President of the United States. Even bigger than that, I could be meeting with the God of the universe privately and I will get up and walk out. Why? Well, as humans go, they are my number one priority. And we have a little thing where I say, if you need me, like really badly, not to tell me you want me to pick up Chipotle on the way home. (laughs) That happened with the boys a couple of times. I was in an elders meeting and and I get two calls from Tyler back to back. Holly was out of town and and I'm like, oh Lord, what is happening at the house right now? They're home alone. I walk out of the meeting and Tyler's like, daddy, can can you pick up Chipotle on the way home? I'm like, bro, that's not what the bat phone is for. (laughs) But they know because you are my priority, when you call like that, I respond immediately no matter what. Question, when God calls you just once, how immediate is your response? Let me show you how immediate it should be. Look in verse 9 of Exodus 33. As he went into the tent, Moses, 
the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Wait a minute, Preston. I don't see anything about Moses' immediate response to God. No, no, I'm showing you God's immediate response to Moses. Let me read it to you again. As he went into the tent. Here's how immediately God responds to your going into his presence to be alone with him, immediately. Every time you go in, he immediately responds. Get the picture. As soon as Moses crossed the threshold of the tent of meeting, the pillar of cloud would descend upon it and God would meet with him there. God desires my response time to meet with him to be as fast as his response time is to meet with me. King David said it like this in Psalm 27, verse 8. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. How quickly do you respond when the God of the universe says, come away with me? I don't care what I'm doing. When Jesus said, listen, by comparison, it needs to look like you hate your mother, father, brother, sister's family. Here's what he's saying. I want you to respond more immediately when I call than when anybody else does. When the God of the universe says, come away with me, here should be our response all of 2024 and for the rest of our lives. Whoop! Why would you ever wait a few moments if the king of the universe said, you know, out of all the things I could do right now, you know what I really want to do? I just want to be alone with you. Why would you be like, eh, got a few things to do. I'll stop by before bed. No, oh, when you call on him, he responds immediately. And that's what he wants from us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a few moments as we are starting off a new year to prioritize God's presence. So would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? The most powerful part of this message isn't going to be what I teach you. It's going to be what you give God. So just take a look at all the clutter in your heart and in your life, all the things that keep getting in the way of prioritizing alone time with him, practicing the presence of God. You may need to repent. You may need to move it out of the way in your heart. But just communicate to him in the most special way you can. God, you and your presence are my priority. The world is out there right now using the same word we are, manifest, to talk like this. What are you manifesting in 2024? That's not how we're talking about this word. What you're saying to God right now is, God, I want to see more of your manifest presence this year than any year heretofore. And here's what I'm going to move out of the way this year. I've been binging Netflix way too much. I'm gonna get it out of the way. I've been doing this too much, that too much. I'm gonna move it out of the way. God, you alone are my priority. And each and every one of us says to you right now in this moment where you are in this place, hear the cry of our heart. When you call, we are going to drop everything. We will pull the vehicle over stop everything and make you the priority.
Spirit of the living God, would you help hold us accountable this year? to keep you, O oh God, as our priority. Holy Spirit, move whatever needs to move out of the way to make more room for more of you, that you might manifest yourself in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Step number two, if you're taking notes, if you want to encounter more of God, step two is to acknowledge. This one probably sounds simple, but it's absolutely essential. And most believers don't do this very often. Acknowledge God. I want you to imagine you are a world-renowned country music star. Anybody like country music up in this thing? Okay. If you don't, God will work on you over time. <laughs> but I want you to imagine you're a world-renowned country music singer. And you play in the biggest venues in the world. 80 to 100,000 people every night. You're married. And what would it do for your marriage if at the beginning of every concert, before you welcome the tens of thousands of people who paid money, who are screaming your name, what would it do for your marriage if the way you started off every concert was to walk out on the stage and say, hey, it's great to have all of you here, but before I really welcome all of you, I just want you to know the most special person in my life just so happens to be in this room tonight. My bride. My husband. What if you started off, instead of saying, what's up, Albuquerque? <laughs> you said, the person I can't live without is present in this place. That's acknowledgement. Okay, question, what do you think it would do in the heart of God if every room you ever walk into in your life, you take that approach? When was the last time you walked into a business meeting and before you took a look at who's sitting around the conference table, you step in like a little girl, like a little boy? Even if it's just in your heart and no one knows it's happening and you just look around and say, oh my word, you are here. The God who created the universe is here in this room with me right now. What do you think it would do in, in your relationship with God if every room you walk into, you acknowledge his being there? The acknowledgement of God's presence involves a constant awareness of God's eternal and immeasurable desire to abide with you everywhere all the time. If you're in Exodus 33, flip over to Genesis 28. This is also another favorite chapter in the Old Testament. This so happens to be the chapter God gave Pastor Robert when he gave him the name Gateway Church. It also happens to be the passage that God gave me about naming our church Pillar. I'll give you the backstory before we jump into the text. Jacob has just had this incredibly holy dream where God manifests himself. And I want to show you Jacob's response, how he acknowledges God and teaches us that acknowledgement only comes after awareness. You have to be aware that God is everywhere before you can acknowledge that he is there. Watch how he responds when he wakes up. Genesis 28, verse 17. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely, most certainly, the Lord is in this place. And watch this. And I wasn't even aware of it. You know how many times as a pastor I hear people say, I just don't feel God's presence. I just don't 
feel he is there. Jacob is teaching us how to see those moments. Jacob is saying, I didn't even know God was here. Now, most certainly, I know he is. He says, I wasn't even aware of it. The problem wasn't God's presence. It was my understanding of his presentness. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not even know it. How aware are you that every room you ever walk into, God is there? If everywhere you go, you don't feel you are experiencing God's everywhere presence, what makes you think you will ever be anywhere where you will experience his manifest presence? Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8, David describes it like this. This is how he calibrated his heart and mind to understand God's everywhere presence. He said, God, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. And then he goes on a run. If I ride the wings of the morning, I go to the deepest depths of the ocean. You're there. Here's what he's saying. There is nowhere I can or ever will go where God is not. That was his level of awareness. Just because you're not aware God is in the room doesn't mean he's not in the room. There are people right now in this room who are experiencing the tangible presence of God. And then there are those who don't feel like they're feeling anything. It doesn't make anybody bad and it doesn't make anybody good. Here's what it points out. It just comes down to their awareness. What would your life look like if every room you walk into in 2024, before a word comes out of your mouth, in your heart, you pause and take a moment and say, you are here. Let's try and find out, shall we? Let's just see if we don't see more of his manifest presence if we start acknowledging constantly his everywhere presence. I, I don't talk about this much, but I believe God is a God who giggles because I've heard it. From time to time, I feel like I've heard the giggles of God. And the last time I heard it was last year during ski season. I was going up a lift by myself. And it was, I mean, snowing, snowing, 10 to 12 inches that day, okay? Which in my vernacular, that day is called a holy day. <laughs> and I'm riding up this lip by myself, and I literally just said out loud like a four-year-old, oh my word, you were here. You're seated with me right now on this lift. You're the one who made it snow, so my heart would smile. You've been chasing me down every single run at 57.4 miles per hour. <laughs> the church's life insurance policy will only go faster than that. Oh my word, you are here. And here was the sound I felt the Lord respond with in that moment as we ride up the lift together. <laughs> Preston, is this how it's going to be? And here's my response. No, because tomorrow I've endeavored to do this even better than I'm doing today. I don't care about the skis. I don't care about the snow. I can't wrap my mind and heart around the fact that you are here. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life not just acknowledging that you're here, but celebrating the fact that you are. And here's what I've learned. Every time I do, I feel, if this is me on the lift, as I acknowledge him, this is what I feel like. If he were sitting next to me tangibly, I feel like he goes like this. 
and I just keep going, and I feel this. And I start crying, and I feel this. There is nothing better than the nearness of God. Nothing. But there's a protocol to experience, experiencing his manifest presence. And acknowledgement is essential. A mouth which consistently acknowledges God's presence comes from a heart which is constantly aware of God's presence. And a heart which is always aware of God's presence together with a mouth with, which acknowledges God's presence will lead to eyes which see God, God's manifest presence in consistently new ways. How do you acknowledge God when you become aware that he's walked into the room? Yesterday, as I was doing run-throughs for this message over at my office, I felt the Lord give me a picture of what he wants from me and you, what kind of acknowledgement he wants. And he reminded me of the five-year-old five we're fostering. We've had him, he's five. We've had him for more than half of his life. And to us, he's become like a son. And the Lord reminded me, without fail, I honestly cannot think of a time where I have walked through the front door of our home where this child has not done what I'm about to tell you. Even more than my children. This kid can be watching Bluey, his favorite show, or playing his favorite game, my singing manchas, which is how he says monsters. My singing manchas, daddy. He could be playing his favorite game. When he hears the front door of our home open and those heavy steps of the weightiest person who lives under that roof, that kid drops what he's doing and races to the front door, runs into me like a freight train, wraps his arms around my legs and says, Daddy, you're home. And yesterday, I just felt the Lord go, want to know how I want to be welcomed into the room every time I walk into the room with you? Daddy, you're home. You're here with me. That's what Maxon's saying. You left work to come be with me. Can you wrap your mind around the fact that God, seated on the throne, can be both there and leave his desk at work to come be with you? I don't understand how it all works. I just know what happens. When was the last time he walked into the room and you dropped everything and said, Daddy, you're here. Do you not think if you more consistently acknowledge his presentness with that type of welcome that you might experience more of this? How do you respond when he walks into the room? Let's take a few moments. He is here. The king is here. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And just take a moment. Right there in your heart. Love it. People are already responding. Why don't you just send a message of what 2024 is going to look like every time he walks into the room? Why don't you give him a welcome you've never given him before? Don't be like Maxon, just do you. What does it look like in your heart to welcome the King of Glory into the same space you are in? What does rolling out the red carpet of your heart look like? Forget about everybody else in this room. The king is here.
Just respond. Ain't nobody watching you except the God of the universe. How will his little five-year-old respond right now as he walks into this room? Holy Spirit, we repent. Every single one of us repents for ever being in a room that you walked into where we just had a meh response. God, I want to be more like Maxon. I want to drop everything. When you sweep into my truck, I want to pull over. I don't care if it makes me like... God, we acknowledge your hereness. We acknowledge your immeasurable and eternal desire to abide with us everywhere all of the time. We acknowledge you. Surely the Lord is in this place. God, we acknowledge you are here. And we are going to acknowledge this year more than any year prior that you are in this place. Help us to do so, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Step three, and we'll wrap up. Step three is revere. Revere. God will not consistently reveal himself to anyone who does not revere him. Reverence is awe-inspired respect. The Bible often calls reverence the fear of God. If you're in Genesis 28, look at the very next verse, verse 17. Watch Jacob's response after he verbally says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. I was not aware of it. But Jacob was also afraid. Wait a minute. God's manifestly present, and Jacob's so afraid he wants to run away from God? Not that kind of afraid. Watch. The Bible shows us what kind of fear. Jacob was also afraid and said these words. What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. If you are going to draw near to God, you're going to have to understand the fear of God. Every friend of God recorded in Scripture had a healthy fear of God. Reverence is a righteous response to a revelation of God, and God often responds by revealing himself even more to those who revere him. I'll show it to you. Numbers chapter 20, verse 6. The people are griping. Moses and Aaron don't know what to do. They immediately turned towards God. Watch what happens. Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. Notice they revered. Then God revealed. Question, what would you do 
if the God of the universe walked right into this room right now? Manifestly. Where you could see him, hear him, touch him, feel him, smell him, all the senses and then some. What would you do? There's really only two responses. It's either to be in awe or to just be, eh. If you don't live in the awe of God, here's what I promise you. You will live in the meh towards God. Time and time again, God went on record and said, I must be regarded as holy by all people. He even said to Moses, hey, tell Aaron and everybody working in this thing, don't just try and come in anytime you want. There's a protocol here. I'm in charge, not you. I am to be regarded as holy. How do you know we regard him as holy? We revere him. What would you do? I really want you to think about this. Don't just tune me out right now. What would you do if the God of the universe manifestly, tangibly walked into this room right now? I want to show you, you can go back to Exodus 33. I want to show you a little bit of chapter 34. So God and his best friend Moses are going back and forth. And Moses says, well, if you're not going, don't make us go. God says, I'll personally go with you. Moses says, well, if I found favor with you, show me your glorious presence. Another way to say it, show me a side of yourself you've never let me see before. Okay, this is how best friends talk. God goes, okay, I will but I, I can't let you look upon my face because no man can look upon my face and live. So God passes before him, and I want you to watch how Moses responds. Exodus 34, verse five. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with Moses. And God called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord himself passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. And watch as God passes before Moses how Moses responds. Moses immediately fell down on his face before the Lord and worshiped. What does one do when the king of glory passes before them? You don't worry about your dignity. You don't worry about the bald spot they can see. You don't worry about how you come across. What do you do when the king of glory walks into the room you're in? You show reverence and say, Things like, I am not God. You alone are God. There is none beside you. There is no one above you. There is no one in all the earth like you. And I don't deserve to be in the same room as you. But I have accepted what your son did for me so that when you are in the same room as me, I can boldly come to you. God, you are in this place. And I don't care about my cars. I don't care about my house. I don't care about my stuff. You are here. And you are you and I am not. I don't have the weight of the world on my shoulders. Because you are holding. 
the universe in the palm of your hand. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? Or maybe you want to kneel. Maybe you want to stand and lift up your hands. How might you show as we start this new year the reverence you have in your heart right now in this moment? We're either going to step into the awe of God or the meh of man. And the meh of man isn't going to part the waters of the sea that you stand before. You may lay prostrate before the Lord. You may not be able to, so do so in your heart. But what does reverence look like? We are but grasshoppers, O oh God. You sit above the circle of the earth. You set every star in its place. You named every one of them. You pull back the curtain of heaven and make a tent out of it. Come on, lavish your reverence. Lower yourself and exalt him more than ever.
last night during this time, I felt the Lord just strongly whisper these words, Preston. Whatever you don't look upon in reverence, you will look at as a convenience. I must be regarded as holy. God, we repent. We repent. You are holy. There is no one like you. In 12 months from now, when you look in our direction as a church, may you be able to say, I have rarely in all of history been revered the way this group of people has revered me. Spirit of the living God, help us live in the fear of God. Your word says, the secret of the Lord is the fear of the Lord. Help us to live in holy awe of you every minute of every day. In Jesus' name, amen.